We're glad to have you here. I just want to do a few acknowledgements, um, beginning with the Mervyn Bogart Foundation, who generously supported this exhibition, and then Sean Latham, I think, there he is, uh, and the Oklahoma Center for the Humanities at the University of Tulsa for partnering with us on this exhibition and programming. We have some exciting programming coming up. You can go to either one of our websites to see what we are having, but I want, did want to highlight um, April 13th, The Collector's Passion of Tea and Teacups, and then um, April 29th, Tea, Myth, and Medicine. Um, I understand it's a nurse from the University of Tulsa who's going to talk about um, medicinal teas, which will be pretty exciting. And then the Lysander Piano Trio will be here Friday evening, April 28th. We have some flyers up there you may want to grab. We're partnering with um, Chamber Music Tulsa on that one. So uh, please go to our website, check out any other program that, that we have coming up. I also want to acknowledge our board of directors, um, amazing board of directors that we have here. I think most of you know at least one or two of them. They're very involved with all of our programming, our exhibitions, and um, fundraising. So I see Jean-Anne and Jan, if you just wave. And, <laughs> and then our Teresa. amazing, oh, hi, Teresa. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then our amazing staff that, that um, your blood's team went away, blood, sweat, and tears, not tears, but blood and sweat, literally, lives about every time we <laughs> put up an exhibition. Um, you see Ellen over there, and Crystal, and Catherine, and Jen, who are not here. Um, and now Crystal uh, Brewer, our exhibitions director, is going to introduce our curators. Thank, thank you. you. Um, so thank you all for being here. I just want to echo again um, to the Oklahoma Center for the Humanities for partnering with us. Uh, because if it weren't for that partnership, this exhibition wouldn't exist at all. Um, as many of you know, each year they choose a theme for the year and then partner with other organizations to come up with wonderful programming in the humanities. And this year, that theme was food. Um, so again, our board members on our exhibitions committee decided to interpret that in terms of tea uh, and all the different ways that tea influences our life, how there's the ceremonial part of it, the cultural part of it, and so many others, which the artists um, work that you'll see today interprets that, and our curators will talk more about that as well. So thank you so much for that. Uh, and again, the programming that Kathy talked about, this month literally is the most programming that 108 has ever done in the history of its existence, which I think is just really exciting. <laughs> to this talk and the three programs that Kathy mentioned, we also are partnering with OVAC for an Ask workshop and we're also uh, doing another of our Delve workshops. So it's a very busy month and lots of exciting things happening going on. Um, so I just want to introduce to you uh, first Janet Hasegawa who has a doctorate in psychology and was a pediatric psychologist on the faculty of the University of Colorado Health Sciences Center for several years before pursuing her interest in art after moving to Tulsa in 1991. She studied ceramics for four years with Tom Manhart at the University of Tulsa, uh, with a particular emphasis in Japanese ceramics and aesthetics, which was her tie to this exhibition. Um, she continues to be interested in the interface between individual psychology, culture, and art within the community. And the next I'll introduce An Tui Nguyen, who is a multimedia artist whose work spans from photography, video, to performance and installation art, and she continues uh, searching for ways to explore family of origins, identity, differences, and cultural conflicts, focusing on food and language. And she is also perfectly tied, the 2016-2017 Fellow at the Oklahoma Center for Humanities at the University of Tulsa, and also is the Assistant Professor of Photography at Rogers State University in Claremore. So join me in welcoming her. So, um, we were brought in to talk, uh, to try and come up with an exhibition about tea that was related to tea. And Antwi and I uh, had the job of trying to define how we wanted to structure the exhibition. And I think we also have great help from like Crystal and, and Sean as well, right? Um, figure out how to put time into that's how um, the idea kind of accumulated um, that we wanted to explain on like multimedia and beside the traditional notion of how uh, we usually perceive a tea ceremony or talking about the art object which is uh, tied strongly with that uh, ceremony would be a like teapot or teacup but we would like it to be a much more um, 
diversity in terms of what we can put it together and bring it to the community here in Tosa. Um, so I think we put up the call with the help of Crystal um, at the beginning of the year, right? And um, we each kind of reach it out in our own community and um, to um, broadcast this call and try to get as many internet um, national calls as possible because definitely we would like um, the exhibition to showcase local artists, but it's also invite conversation from the national kind of community in art making, um, talking about a similar matter, and of course bringing more quality work to, to Tosa. That is one of the, the key elements in uh, our selection process as well. Absolutely. So we really wanted to try and expand the concept as much as possible. Um, in terms of looking at tea, its role in people's lives, um, how we relate around tea. And um, as Antwi mentioned, that the typical way in which we think about tea, most people would think immediately of a teapot. So, and fortunately, we got many representations of teapots in many different mediums, which was really an exciting thing. So we're just gonna come over here to the teapot wall um, as a way of sort of starting. Um, to talk about it. And, um, Artwee, do you want to talk a little bit? We had three prizes to yeah. give for this exhibit. And I'm just going to say it was incredibly difficult. We just kept circling the gallery one after the other. And it was like we each had favorites, and then our favorites would change, and then we'd have another favorite. So it was very, very hard. But we, we tried to um, really look for um, something that spoke really strongly to both of us um, as a concept. Yes. Do you want to talk about this piece? So let's see. Um, so beside definitely um, the theme. So it's have to tie with the theme. It's also have to show great craftsmanship. And we, like for that piece that you're looking right here, are you talking about this piece mm -hmm. uh, by Michael? So we also trying to think of how um, material being changed, and it's a, a different kind of material that depicting the same subject matter. So it gives the viewer a much more excitement to look at the work and really examine um, the piece itself. And I, and I think that's how I really like, um, like be in my own art practice, or so when I look at artwork as well, I want that kind of challenge of, okay, that is very familiar, but it's so unfamiliar, and that's why I draw my attention to. And I guess another reason why I really like that piece, beside the material that the artists use, um, to kind of break down that traditional notion of the form that we're so familiar, is also, it's almost like a painting itself. The way that the artist um, using paint on the material in order to kind of create that gradual change of these uh, different, this term I always messed up, um, H-U-E, because hue. Yeah. Um, that uh, hue. Um, so it's a very kind of exciting way for the eye to kind of try to figure out the shape, uh, the form in this case, and then the color, and then different material. And it's um, kind of well, have like a different take onto the culture too. I think the combination of materials together that you were talking about, and I love the really, the incredible gradation between yeah. the, the different <coughs> colors and yeah. it. It's such a strong like, texture, right? Like mm -hmm. almost like the textile texture mm -hmm. that we want to touch so bad, um, <laughs> which please don't. <laughs> we have gloves, but I don't, I don't think you should touch it anymore. You can imagine in your own dream that, like, oh, I really touched that piece and that is how it felt like. Um, but that is one of the pieces that we, we decided um, that it should get an award because right. of the theme, the craftsmanship, if you look closely into it, it's um, such an exquisite piece. Mm -hmm. and the material too is different than, um, than the other one that stand out for that um, theme that we chose. Um, this, these pieces are um, by two different artists, interestingly. Um, they, they are both out of sterling silver. And uh, I, I really loved it because it showed um, the, the juxtaposition of the two pieces together shows different aspects of using tea because this is a tea infuser um, that you would put on top of your cup and drip the water through. Um, and, but it's also just quite beautiful. To, it looks like a little nest to me. 
and um, and then of course this is a teapot, um, which I think technically could probably be used, but uh, I think it's it's made to be primarily almost totally an art object, and I loved that about it, the way that the medium was used in that way. Yeah. Yes, it's metal. So yes, it will be hot. It yeah, it would, it would not be. It would not be useful at yeah. all. Or if you want to know whether or not it's practical, you can purchase it. <laughs> and test it out. And you can know try it. it. And you do a, a tape and you send it to 108, and then we show it. Okay. And that's how we know. Um, these pieces were actually made by a ceramic artist who now is teaching in Oklahoma City. Community College. At the community Oklahoma. Community College in Oklahoma City. Um, and I, I still remember when I first opened up the slide to look at this piece. And I, I just thought the glazes, the glaze that he was using, especially the subtlety of the color on it, it's very unusual. And I just thought it was incredibly beautiful. Um, what I couldn't see um, when he sent the picture um, was that these, I'm going to put the gloves on so I can show you all and this is really hard to hear so you're gonna I'm gonna try and bring it around a little bit it's a very subtle sound the tops of these two are rattles so I don't know if you can hear them or not but uh, I just thought it was such an interesting juxta juxtaposition of, of what is a very functional object but then he's obviously taken the time to do something playful and, uh, and they look really playful to me to look at them from the outside. Yeah, I recall when we was looking at these lights and this piece jumped out to both of us how animated the piece are, those two pieces. Because um, a lot of those, if you look around, or traditionally like they're very static and they have like a beautiful art object and they just stand there and look at me, I'm so greatly done. Like, I'm so pretty in the set, and that's what we kind of draw into. We purchased the piece that, like, kind of showcased not only the status, but it's like the beauty as the thing that we be so proud that present on to other people who came and enjoy the tea. And for this piece, these two, they carry on something else, like, so fun, so playful, and like we say, so animated, like, jumping out. Uh, Compared to the rest of the the other submission, so we really agree, like right on that we want to take this P into the show <laughs> and this rattle. So it's fun. And the one thing that um, Jeanette showed me, which I I was really scared of touching these objects because I'm very bad with coordinations. <laughs> like, so when anything that precious and is made, they fragile. I have to stay away. So I didn't got a chance to touch or wearing glove and touching them. But Jeanette, I'll pick it up, you can hear the rattle, and that's how I can start seeing this drawing underneath um, the lid. And I think it's also a very fun touch, uh, mm -hmm. like he added on, um, kind of different than the other. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Took the time to really execute something yeah. that's going to be on the inside. Yeah. And it's surprised, and also if you look inside it, they're different kind of Glaze, the beauty, the color. Yeah, he's These used to. He's used more of an ash glaze on the inside, very different than the blue celadon that he's put on the outside. Yeah. So. Yeah. I'm just going to say uh, a quick word about this piece, which um, I really love. It's a. She's called it a menge teapot, and menge, of course, is the um, word for Japanese folk craft. Um, and almost all the Japanese teapots were actually metal. And so she's fashioned one out of porcelain reflecting what would have been a traditional Japanese teapot. So I thought that it's a fun thing, but you don't necessarily know that in the, unless you know about Japanese folk craft. So I thought it was a very interesting um, little piece. So we're going to talk about this. This piece won Best, Best Craftsmanship Award for the show. It's a very kind of hard decision which one to make because obviously the level of craftsmanship in, in all of these pieces is very, very high. Uh, it was very hard um, to select. Um, I really felt that this piece, the way in which he executed the glazing, the control that he had over it, the preciseness with which he executed his idea 
and put his glazes together and constructed this piece was really, really superior. Um, so I, that was some of my thinking about that. And it's a very, to me, it's also a very kind of playful piece, an interesting piece. Um, so, yeah. Thoughts. I'm gonna say that word wrong again. So okay. Help me out. Okay. Um, but I, when I first look at this piece, um, the handle and the spout, spout um, of the lid and on the side, um, I thought they were bamboo. Like from further away, because I mean that material is so embossed into my brain, and the structure is very um, Asian kind of looking of the teapot. So automatically, I thought, of, oh, that's in some bamboo uh, material that they constructed, like from further away. And as I draw close to the piece, um, now that the the shapes, that the form that we were created, it's actually like metallic kind of looking, right? The structure of piping yes. um, that people use. Um, so I got right away a different response to it, like how um, how how smart this artist trying to think of using the trompoloi right. right in painting and now apply it onto a three-dimensional object again to trick that trick the viewer or the treat um, treat tr ah trick trick trick, trick, trick me <laughs> um, to like my first initial response to the work so I think it's a very interesting way to look at this three-dimensional piece and I be able to relate it back onto two two-dimensional work. So I think it's a very smart way uh, to kind of play it out and using all of these intertwined a way because um, the trick of the eye um, and that's very exciting for me to to be excited when I look at some work that can make me feel something else or uh, trick my mind and my, my vision. Yeah. And if um, one thing that Jeanette also taught me throughout this process working together I look closely now in the clay um, and the way that they glazed, the artist placed the piece. Um, and when it comes to like two, three, four, five different kind of glaze, right, there are more opportunities for mistake to, to happen. And if the artist managed to contain them within that, sh that form and all of the glaze, that just within those territory they're working, that's, they really get into like what they know what they're doing. So that's also, um, we're going back to all of these pieces that we both really like and I really like it more because it have other kind of response for me. But then, like Jeanette taught me, if we really look into the material and the craftsmanship. Um, so that's why some pieces look really great, but when we look deep, deep, deeper into it, uh, no, those is not that like exquisitely done in terms of craftsmanship. But I think we both agree on this piece and another option. And, uh, we decided this, this is the one. Top notch, the way it's done. So we're really fortunate today to have some of the artists with us. Um, if, if you're an artist who's here and you have a piece here, and I I don't talk about your piece, please let me please let me know. But I know Bryce is here. This is his piece, and so we were going to ask him to just say a few few words about it. Bryce is um, teaches at Roger State College, right? She University. With her. Yeah, university. <laughs> it's not college. University. university. Sorry, I'm behind the time. Okay. So Man, so. forget it. I'm out of here. <laughs> um, so when the the exhibit came, uh, the call for entry came out. Antwi kept going, walking, passing me in the hall, going, "You ought to put something in. You ought to try. You ought to." Put, like, I don't know. I don't know. I, I haven't thrown a teapot in years. I don't know. I haven't. I don't know if I want to do a teapot. You know, I, so I just kept going back and forth, and I told her like 20 times, "No, I'm not doing this. I'm not going to do it." And then one night, late at night, I was listening to something that Donald Trump had said, <laughs> and getting more livid by the minute. And you know, I thought, you know, I blame the Tea Party for putting him in office, and. Um, I'm going to throw that out there, and if they don't want to go all political with this, then they'll kick me out, and if they're okay with it, then I guess I'll get in. I don't know, but uh, so I decided to do a proposal that was uh, a little bit on the political side. Um, it basically is grass, which represents all the things that we have been trying to nurture in America, the, 
uh, equal rights, civil rights, you name it, you know, the things that we've been trying to encourage to grow. And then we have a giant tea bag, kind of Klaus Oldenburg style up here on the top that's just kind of weighing down. The table is painted as the, um, with the uh, election map from November 8th, uh, the night of November 8th. And, um, and then we have the tea party symbol as the tag for the thing and for the, for the tea bag. And when you pour hot water on it, the holes become, it, the table becomes a tea uh, infuser or a tea strainer and water drips right down through it and therefore killing the grass underneath, <laughs> killing so it's the Tea Party symbolically killing the everything that America has been standing for and trying to encourage to grow. So, so I got all. You know. So I, I just want to say, if you weren't here last night to see it, Bryce actually performed this piece um, three times, I think, during the three night, times. and it was very uh, well attended. There were lots of people crowded around to watch. So cheering. Um, <laughs> but one of the things that was really exciting for me, having uh, looked at the piece initially and when you submitted it and then seeing it installed, but was when you poured it over, and I know I wasn't the only one, I had several other people say the same thing to me, was the, the patterns that it made when it was dripping. I really liked that. So, so if you can find a way to like make it so it drips continuously, I think it. Would. <laughs> but no, I thought I thought that was really interesting. Uh, to me, it was part of the like aesthetic of it. It was really pretty yeah, fascinating. Sorry, I'm happy to. Um, I've never made a teapot before in my life out of anything, and so when this show came about, I uh, my first thought was, what do I have surrounding me that I can utilize to make a teapot, and. Consequently, the foundation of the teapot here is um, fabric that I weave, and the warp on the loom is cotton, and the weft is the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times cut into strips, and then just um, made into fabric. So that was the foundation of this, and then I thought, oh, mightily, what do I do next? And so, um, I do do calligraphy, and oftentimes I, I get um, U-line tubes that are full, filled with rolled paper that I can use for calligraphy. So I had this U-line tube that was about this big around and about this tall. So I cut it into four segments, and the, the tube is inside of all of this. So I thought, well, that's the beginning of the body of the teapot. And then I have corrugated paper, so I cut it into one inch, two inch, three inch, and onward pieces that would go around the tubing. And then I rolled up pieces of newspaper and put them in every other place of that. So I put that all together, and then of course the next step was what, how, what do I do next? So many years ago, I had made some paper mache bowls, and I took that and put it at the top. And then um, these these are um, tubes from um, when you um, get a whole lot of fiber that you want to weave. These the, the fibers are uh, rolled on this these tubes. So I cut these. This, is, this tube is covered with felt outside and inside. And then, because I knew that I needed some beads and, fat and um, leaves on here, tea leaves, I made the tea leaves, and these are the little stalks from the tea leaves. And then this was just something that I think was hanging around my studio, so <laughs> it went in there. <laughs> this is the repelling rope. Um, the heavy repelling rope that I just made a break of, and then put this on top of it, and this on top of it. Um, I'll show you. Uh, suddenly, I had this all put together, but I didn't know how to put this on top of this. And it took me a couple of weeks because I kept thinking about it and thinking about it. 
and I'll just show this to you, but no one can touch this. <laughs> I took off the top like this, and in here I used industrial felt, and then I had a little mouse, so I put him in there, and he now, he now lives there. So he's, he's part of the teapot, and that's my story. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> it's always great to hear the artists describe their work. I, lo I love uh, hearing your process that you Is that okay? That. Yes, it's lovely. <laughs> oh, great. Okay. Thank you. No, I, just, I love the graphic quality of this piece, and I like oh, the scale you. of it a lot. It was a um, very nice addition. Yeah. And I think now that um, everybody hear about the structure, right, the base, how you're weaving these two um, newspapers together, right? And yes. You say that's almost like making a political comment about how the whole structure of the teapot or how the American um, being created on what kind of, um, how do I say, um, like the way that the, the baseline of how this country kind of built on, like oh, the, okay. the value yes. of it, like a social commentary that, that, you, that you have um, nicely kind of embedded, hidden, basing it up to all the things that we structure onto it, the foundation of everything. Thank you very much. Yeah. Woven yeah. together with free speech. Yeah, <laughs> and then I think it's a nice thing how we um, like put those two pieces together because the, the teacup right next yeah. to it is also made from the Tosa World uh, yeah. newspaper. Yes, yeah. and she's not here today, but she uh, has been one of my weaving students for, oh, wow. for a so long time. Amazing. And wow. um, we're so glad. I was so proud. I was so proud of yeah. her when she was accepted and had made the teapot. I mean, the, the teacup and all the saucer. So, thank you for putting the clothes together. Thank you, Jeanette. Thank you, me too. Yes. <laughs> I personally did not paint this piece. I don't know how meticulously that you guys have to go through. So maybe Crystal can kind of talk a little bit about um, the way that the artist. Um, specifically, meticulously um, create guide and instruction for you to install the piece for the viewer to see. Do you want to share that? Sure. Bit? So each one, well, they were in, in groups in Ziploc bags with dates, and each day she had written down what it was. So it's say like coffee with Jan or tea with dad, um, and where it was and what time it was. And then there were a couple of them where she had had multiple cups of coffee at the same sitting and had done one for each one. Um, it took four and a half hours to install. <laughs> but there, there's a really awesome uh, time-lapse video on our Facebook page you want to check out where we do it in 17 seconds. Um, but they're all numbered. They're all numbered, so they're exactly in order. Um, reading love to write and then Oh, gosh. Oh, she said it's a great statement. I thought it was over the course of a year. It was 144 days. Okay, yeah, 144 days. Yeah. I mean, it's such an interesting way to be able to view this work and um, understand like why the artist come into to making such a work. It's such a beautiful collective memories, right? We see here is a, the artifact, the leftover of something that might just simply be discarded like after that, that process of gathering, but she like, collect all of those and want to portray them in, in, in this way of install. And each of those are repeating somehow is remind me of that memory, like going back with the same, visiting the same person, mm -hmm. um, or just looking at them and thinking of the conversation I have with a stranger or with my mom or with my dad. Um, and they're all here, right? Because usually we think of memory, we think of, of them and we imagine the vision of how it's taking place and very vaguely about the conversation happening. So it's very intangible in our memory and here we see that, um, that, that um, object of the memory that somehow is solidified itself into a different form. And I think it's a very beautiful way of how we now um, transform it or she create it into a tangible object and make it into this very beautiful installation uh, for us to be in the very archive. 
It is like an archive. Yeah, yeah. almost like in a library, the mm -hmm. job of librarian. So um, I just want to take a minute to talk about this piece, which I think is a very interesting piece. Um, so when we, um, when we view things, we obviously view them on like slides, now digital sort of slides. And um, I viewed this piece, and the artists submit dimensions to the pieces of work that they submit. And I saw the dimensions, and I looked at it, and I still, in my mind, thought this was a little teapot. And it arrived. And I saw it here and I went, oh my goodness. And, and, but I love it at, at this scale. I mean, I think this is really perfect. And I was um, really thrilled with it. It's um, a Raku piece, um, which I don't know how many of you here have done Raku, but Raku is a very um, intense uh, way of making ceramics. And the pieces themselves have a lot of grit in them because it has to, um, expand and contract really rapidly because you take the piece like out of being very very hot and then you dunk it in water or you dunk it in another substance um, which um, solidifies the glaze that's on it. So to be able to make a really large piece like this out of Raku and to have it survive um, is pretty remarkable especially with the protrusions that a teapot naturally has. It's really remarkable. Um, and if you come by and um, look Inside, you can see part of how he structured it in order to help this piece uh, make it through the firing. It's very interesting. It has a whole inner uh, layer to it that you can see through the spout. But um, I, it's called yin. It's a yin teapot, and I, I, uh, I really um, enjoyed that. We are really fortunate to have the artist here for this, Jan Eckhart Butler. You want to say a few things? Um, um, some of you know me as a, a porcelain artist, um, and I've worked in little figures for many, many years. And about 14, 15 years ago, I went into teaching, and I'm a middle school art teacher now at Holland Hall. And I don't have a lot of studio space, and in fact, I have nothing at home right now. Anything I do has to be done in school. And I also don't have a lot of time. But <coughs> purposely, I did not write what the passion is involved in this so that people could understand it first from looking at it and maybe you get the idea. I am not passionate about clay anymore. I am passionate about butterflies, specifically monarch butterflies. <laughs> and I, over the years of studying what we now know is their winter uh, grounds in Michoacan in Mexico, and I've seen so many pictures of these butterflies flying off and coming back on, you know, you see movies about it, you know, and I really want to go there, and I just keep imagining this, I see these pictures. Of it. So I thought, when the tea thing came around, I thought, well, how can I make a butterfly thing? I wasn't thinking, how do you make a teapot? I was thinking, well, how can I do a butterfly thing? So I made a little hand-built teapot, I made some little tea leaves, and I made a lot of butterflies. <laughs> <laughs> and then I had to figure out how I was going to photograph it to give the idea that I really wanted it tall. So I made enough pieces. I never put the whole thing together. I put part of it together, took a picture from here, and told them, this is how big it can go, and this is what you can do with it if you want to. And I just said, oh. <laughs> I don't know what else to say about it. Well, um, this, this piece was very interesting. I mean, I think you can see the dramatic um, uh, shadows on the wall that I think are really a great part of this piece. And I know um, when Jen was here placing this piece, um, and she got all the pieces up to the ceiling. I was like, oh, I love, I love how tall that is. That's really wonderful. But it was really when she got the lighting placed and lit it up, it was like, wow. It really brought the whole piece alive. And, and it does um, kind of look like it's flying to me. Yeah. One, one of the things I knew I had a limitation in that I couldn't do color. Uh, as in my teaching, I'm doing more and more with construction and just um, the uh, composition of things and understanding composition in black and white. So I knew I had to do something just with white and shadow for this because the color would not, not be there. Is there also a statement about the, the decline of monarchs with the ones that kind of has a sadness yeah. to it? Yeah, <laughs> right. 
Yeah, those I mean, could be, yeah. It's funny that you saw it that way. I saw it as transformative. <laughs> I saw the tea leaves at the bottom transforming into butterflies that are yeah, taking flight. So and it's really you know, interesting. It doesn't have to be butterflies. They, they started out being petals. Okay. Flower petals. And, uh, and as soon as I started to make some of them, I, I closed the petals and I said, oh, it could be butterflies or petals. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> so do you plant a lot of new weed? I do. And I'm growing it every year and trying to plant more and more. Plants. So if you guys want to help the monarch, uh, please plant milk native milk. 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 Uh, yep. It's really help the bees and yeah. the monarch and for your garden. It's really beautiful. Yeah. Uh, they come fluffy and they just move around. Yeah. Really adorable. So please uh, do that if you have space. Thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> That's really important for us. How many? Um, at least leather. three. Yeah. We have leather, oh. metal, copper, and wood is underneath. I'm yeah. pretty sure. So. Um, and it is very beautifully done. Um, I, I like the fact that it is a teapot, but, and it and you can take this off, and it is a teapot, but it's obviously not not anywhere near a typical teapot shape. So. Um, uh, this is the chess set. Um, <laughs> I, I just think it's really remarkable. Um, it, um, all of these pieces are functional. So you can take the lids off of them and you can fill them with tea or whatever else you want to put in them. So every single piece was made individually to be that. And I, I love the title of it, which is, Did You Come Here to Play or Drink? <laughs> so, um, so I just, I thought we just really love the kind of concept of it. Um, obviously, I can't even imagine how much time that it took her to make all of these, all of these pieces and put them together. But the the whole sort of concept and how it's used is, I think, really, really wonderful. Are you going to show them? Excellent. <laughs> oh, I should. But I should. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Okay, so, all right, so I'll just pick up, I'm going to pick up, this is my, oops, the unglomed hand, oh well. This is, this is my favorite little piece, the bishop, and you can tell that he has a little bishop's hat top on it, and since I only have one gloved hand, I'm not going to pick it up, but you can take this little piece off, and there's a little opening there, so it's just, the little perfect vessels. Um, well, this little piece is um, interesting, and I, I'm choosing to talk about it in part because most people might look at it and think, what does this have to do with tea? But this is actually um, a, a fiber artist who made a fiber representation of a chawan, which is a traditional Japanese tea bowl, um, which um, are uh, made obviously in ceramic in Japan. And he's made the shape mimicking the Japanese tea bowl. They are um, considered a very high art form in Japan. They are frequently imperfect. Um, you'll not find one that's perfectly round. That's not how they're made. They're made to be imperfect. Um, and they are really treasured items in Japan. So he chose to make his woven, um, obviously meant to be not utilitarian in any sense of, of the, of the uh, imagination. And he's woven it out of shoelaces um, together with ribbon and uh, like uh, floss. Um, and I, I just, I love this piece. I think it's very playful. I like the take that he has on uh, something related to tea and using the chawan as his um, inspiration for it. Okay, we have the artist here to talk about this. Terry, where are you? There you are. <laughs> Come on up. So I could not make a teapot because I didn't think of doing one out of <laughs> fiber like so many of my friends do. But um, what I did is my mother-in-law passed away last November and my, my husband and his family are British. So when my husband went over uh, to bring some of her things home, he, he brought this little tea cozy that she had made years ago. And um, so I kind of you know, took it. He was using it for packing material. 
but I, I took it and I, I kept it and kept looking at it and then when the call, you know, when I paid attention to the call for entry, um, I thought, well, maybe I'll make a kind of a, a contemporary version of her tea cozy. Um, my mother-in-law was 90 when she died and we had spent the last several years Skyping every Sunday because it was the only way we could see her and uh, my father-in-law until he passed away. Um, very often, it's not like we could go over often. So at, on our Sunday Skypes, it would be 9 a.m. for us and it would be 3 p.m. for them. And they would be sitting down to afternoon tea and I would be having my morning tea. So we always had our tea together on Sunday. And uh, when she was then alone, um, I called her more frequently and during the week and I would always say see you on Sunday because she really liked that idea and she really she thought that was so funny and, and she would giggle and say oh yes yeah, see you on Sunday um, and so that is what I titled the piece see you on Sunday and it, I kind of just did it to honor my mother-in-law and that, that little connection of, of having our tea together once a week. And, um, and I thought, well, this isn't very involved or anything, so I, I almost didn't do it. And I told one of my daughters that, and she said, are you kidding? Tea is your love language. What do you mean you're not going to do this? Get in there and, and do it. And, um, and so I did. And uh, actually, it, it kind of brought some joy to the whole family. Nice, nice way to honor. But well, I just, I really love the story, and I, I love that Terry was here placing things in the shop the other day, and we were talking, and um, she had, you mentioned to me how startled her mother-in-law would be to have a piece that she had made displayed in a contemporary art gallery. <laughs> if, if she's, if she's watching me now, I am in so much trouble. <laughs> She would be more and you took that ratty old thing and showed it to people. But we're just going to hope that she's looking the other way right now. <laughs> and I think we have the artist here, uh, Janine Glenn. Oh, here you are. Great. I, I, I think this piece is really fascinating, and um, I think Janine's going to share the process with you a little bit. And it's, Whatever else she wants to say. It's uh, a woven piece, and uh, actually I sent the picture in with just the tiny tea towel made from tea bags. And then I brought this in as a way of explanation, further explanation, because I, I wasn't sure that people would understand that the warp is cotton, but the weft is actually tea bags that are cut into strips and then spun and then used as a thread to weave back and forth. It's an old Japanese method of shifu, and they used to make clothes that way. And uh, I was talking with another artist, Sally, and she says, I really like this, <laughs> that's my explanation. <laughs> and it's funny because I, I came, I started doing things with, with a uh, double meaning to them, like the tea towel from a tea bag, as a class that I teach in creative spinning to get my students to think outside the box. And she had me thinking outside the box because I just saw this as a material. I didn't see this as a piece. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of interesting. You learn and you grow. Well, the two together, I think, are perfect. So it's wonderful. Yeah, I think last night I was talking to you and you were also saying, um, I don't know, is that appropriate to say? But you were saying how um, you're using the material and like, recycle, right? Like your old. I do, yeah, all kinds of things. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I told you about, I had a lace bra, I cut it up, I spun it. I said, I don't burn my bra anymore, I spin it. Uh, you know. Make it into something. And, and, I mean, my students would come back with all kinds of things that uh, they would ask the desk to bring them up another pillow. They came in disposable cases. They would take the disposable case off and bring it to class and we'd be spinning that. It would just, if it isn't nailed down, it was fair game. And it's, it's fun. We, oh, Easter grass, Christmas tinsel. 
if you can get it through the orifice on the wheel, it, it's fun. <laughs> really appreciate um, the fact that a lot of artists like yourself are using um, material already there, like by object or material being manufactured like millions, millions and just piled up into landfill and what we're going to do about it. And you make that into something else that practical or beautiful uh, for like, contribute into the next life of it. But it's also a very old technique. Yeah. The paper yeah. part is a very old technique. We just expand on other things. Well, I, I just want to take a minute in talking about this piece to talk about um, Antwi and uh, how grateful I am that we were paired together to do the show. I did not know her before <laughs> we started this journey. Now we do. And now we do, yes. <laughs> Thanks to Teresa and John. Right. And, um, and, and it was really great because my background and kind of my bent is very different than on Twees. I, I, my background is in ceramics. Hers is, hers is in performance art and in, um, you know, all the many things, multimedia, you know, all kinds of, of wonderful things. And so what I found is that she really pushed me to think about things differently. And this is one of those pieces. I first saw this piece and it was entered as this hat, um, which was not broken at the time. Um, ha hanging and you could see it and the artist's description of what he wanted to do with the hat and I tend to be very kind of nailed down and I'm like I don't know I don't know about this I think this hat's gonna break I don't you know I don't get this and Audrey was like no I think it'll be really cool and it'll look really great and really wonderful and I have to say you know the hat did break but that that has almost nothing to do with this piece because um, even watching the video is nothing compared to watching, first of all, the artist who made this dance with it on last night. He was incredible, and to see it live was really an amazing experience. And it just brought me so much joy to watch him dancing in this, and then to see everyone else trying it on and dancing in it and how happy they were with that. And it really, I think, anchored people and made people feel like they were really a part of things, which I think you probably knew from the beginning was going to happen, but it mm -hmm. took me actually seeing it. Yeah, so Antonio, Antonio's boy, he's uh, one of the 2017 Tosa Fellow artists um, at the Kaiser Garden. And I think this is one of the that he did like toward his uh, last year, senior years in life, or two. Um, so, how do I say that? Um, so, I mean, um, he's a, he born here, but he's Vietnamese. His parents both like old people, and I am Vietnamese that born in Vietnam that came to the United States. Um, so we have totally different experience of being Vietnamese in those two very different places and the history of our life. Um, but there's something about it that we be able to kind of connect it together in a way that we think um, we see things, but very differently. Like I look at this piece, I thought about it last night too. I came home and I and I think I also talked to Jeanette about how um, he gonna be able to grow show us out of this body of work and the work that he's going to do here in Tosa uh, related to the LGBTQ community across um, in the United States. Um, but it's very fun, like I, the way I look at this traditional Vietnamese Ao Yai, because this is the title of the piece too, it's called Ao Yai, um, in a very like, traditional way. Um, there's a contemporary touch on it, but that is an object that ties so strongly with my culture, that it's part of, of my identity. Like I use this dress in my own photographic work as well, like, in that kind of performative way. And he have a whole different take on to it. Maybe because he's born here, like the way they see differently, um, I guess it's, it's got to be contribute to that conversation of how he construct or reconstruct a different kind of outyai based on he like growing up in, in the state. Um, and it's much more fun. Like I look at it, like why am I so preserved sometimes, way too traditional and serious about my work? Because that's how it is. The way I approach that identity being Vietnamese. And he approaching it maybe a hybrid of Vietnamese American, and it's more free, uh, more fun, and kind of wild in his own way. They like saw him 
like performing and dancing uh, with the piece yesterday. Um, and I, I think another thing that we, um, at, at first, it's a little hard to find like how is that fit into the conversation of um, the bigger theme of this action missions. Um, but then I look at it and I have conversation with Jeanette too. How this artist managed to again materialize something that visible but intangible into something that actually tangible and practical in this case. So he claimed, or at least the way I understood it, and I talked to him is he materialized and created a steep of tea that we see inside the teacup when the water hit the tea and it started to create this beautiful um, translucent of the yellowish, light yellowish mixed with the whiteness of the water. And those are the steep that's coming down. And we see them, but again, we can't touch them. Right, there's no way that we can touch them. So those are the image that we imagine in our brain and then how he be able to kind of materialize it's right here. And I think it's a very interesting way to to twist the material, to twist the concept of what it is, to twist that visual and make it into something else. Um, and then totally break down what it is. It's no longer that from inside the tea, whatever happened in there, but it's trying from itself into a whole different thing. And this I think he also had that, but he didn't really talk about those how the culture that we have, I think there's a problem with like appropriation. Like, and my friend, my other friend from America told me that too, because I talked to them about all the projects I want to do, and she was like, yeah, that's the problem that we have. We appropriate so many times, and we just make it into our way. And um, there was all the artists like making like kimono work like in the East Coast, and then he put up the kimono, the artist put up the kimono, and people just wear the kimono and start with like, appropriate it into on their own body, uh, like the way that they look, the way they change. And there's something about it that I see mm -hmm. last night as well. When people put this dress on, they cover themselves and then they become something else. But then that there's a little tension right there, but it's also depend on the artist. The artist realize that, yeah, there that, is that tension, but whether or not the artist want the viewer to realize is that a problem right there, or you allow that to happen? And he didn't really talk much about that part, so we have to have a deeper conversation about those, uh, just to see where he stands. Um, no, um, this artist, um, let's see, she's an Afghanistan-American artist, um, Gazelle Samize, and she's based in LA. Um, so this piece, I'm gonna get this wrong, 9,409 uh, miles. Um, and there's a model kind of built um, to accommodate with the, the video piece. Because um, as you look through this piece, so he's the one, there's two protagonists in here, and the male protagonist is drawing um, the structure, and that is actually the design for the, for the house that they're going to build uh, in, Afghanistan, uh, in Afghanistan. And um, as you see throughout the piece, it's five minute long, the idea of tea being part of that kind of process. Um, and it's kind of overarching a lot of things that we've been um, trying to communicate throughout the exhibitions. Um, the tea as an object, uh, tea ceremony, um, kind of the gathering is a, um, a medium for conversations that verbal and non-verbal to kind of take place. The drama that happening within these relationships whether it's a um, husband and wife relationship or a family relationship, like all of these people within that role um, is somehow being placed around this tea as a medium for all the things to kind of happen. Um, One of the things I really loved about the film is there's no, there's no sound in the film, there's no dialogue in the film except for the sounds that are um, related to the making of the tea and the drawing on the napkin. Um, and he's just drawing continuously and throwing, throwing it uh, off to the side and drawing and drawing and drawing. And I, I really felt strongly when I saw it, I, I loved um, exactly what Antwi said about the whole idea, the concept of tea as a part of a ritual, tea as a part of longing. Um, and I really felt like 
Um, it's, it's also tea as comfort because she's making the tea for him and he's obviously going and doing the same thing over and over and over again. Um, and I really felt like in, in this case, in some ways, the tea also represented the longing um, that's there in this piece. And so um, we gave it our best conceptual expression award because I love the centrality of the tea in this and all the different um, representations of it. So. Yeah, and I think I kind of like the idea of how the tea is a protagonist by itself. Yeah. It's like the third one that mediate, right? right? Between the two, it's the communication the between the two people. Um, and so it's become, it is a symbolic, uh, it's a, a symbol for, for the uh, relationship they have, and no verbal mm -hmm. at all. Um, she was here last night. Oh, she was. She was here last night, and um, she was saying something. I can't quote her directly, but I think she was saying, "It's a crime to throw away a tea bag." <laughs> so if you ever have tea bags that lay around, if you don't want to compost them, which you should, then you can save them. And then there's her information right on the desk. That if you kindly enough, um, whether or not you contact her, she possibly find a way or send you something that you can mail the tea bag. Right. So then she can work on her project. It's a, a tea bag project. Yeah. Um, and the information is right on the camera. Um, yeah, she's considered herself a mixed media artist. Uh, she made in Santa Fe, if I'm not wrong. So she, she got in yesterday, so she had to get out right away. And I think um, the one thing that we possibly agree on is, again, like using a, a different material instead of using it as a pigment to create a traditional um, painting, right? In the case, like exploring the color or the hue. But like here she's using the tea bag itself and very much kind of elevate it a little bit more and make the two dimensional become a three dimensional. And also reuse that material, the cycle, and give it another life, uh, bring it back to life. Uh, decompose it, but in a different way, and like not going back to the earth, but like put it up here and become something else, adding another life on, onto it. Um, and I really appreciate that element that how, how she come to um, to make the piece come into this way. Yeah, I really love the gradations in the in the um, tones with the especially with the variations in the tea bags and how she's used them and just really painted directly with tea. Mm -hmm. Look at the the quality. Oh, I was curious um, if there were any of the pieces that you had, you guys had that kind of an understanding about or an interpretation of, since the opening of the show that you'd heard the kind of an overwhelming difference mm -hmm. between kind of the kind of people you talked to in the show. You possibly talk more with people than I. <laughs> Don't sneak out. <laughs> but you, would you like to come here on to them? Um, uh, well, um, I have to say um, uh, the, the installation piece down at the end, um, I was talking with someone. I don't think it's necessarily different than the interpretation that you, you had of it, but um, um, I was talking uh, with someone and they said basically that they really loved that piece because it wasn't just about life, but it was about what's left over afterwards and what we leave behind. And I just thought that was such a beautiful and poetic way of thinking about that piece. I went back and looked at it again, and I was like, oh, I, it added a whole new dimension to it for me. So I thought that was a really wonderful thing. I think somebody else kind of told me that, oh, why didn't I think about that? <laughs> <laughs> Easy. It's, it's almost remind me of like solo with drawing as well. It's so meticulously, and sometimes the artist no need to do it. it just create really detailed instruction, and everybody can can do what they uh, they left off. Well, I also I also think that with the performance pieces, this piece and Bryce's piece mm -hmm. down there, I, it's it's impossible. You can look at a video of somebody's work, you can look at a slide of someone's work, but until you actually see it live and you see them perform it, 
I don't think you can ever really appreciate what's happening. And, and I have to say, last night, seeing that happen really made me think differently about both pieces and made me feel differently about them. I mean, I had a positive disposition toward them already, obviously, but it really brought them alive. And there's something about live performance that you just cannot get any other way. So. Well, I think it's, I, my assumption is it's just from use. I saw that starting last night because, um, you know, I think it's just from use and people taking it off and hanging it back up. And those hats are pretty fragile anyway. But the artist, you know, it, I think, I don't know, what, what I took away from it, the artist really wanted people to interact with it. He was very clear about that. That's what he wanted to have happen. And I don't think he made that piece as an art object. He made that piece as an experience. So, and I think that's... Yeah. <laughs> I think that's something really nice about like having a ephemeral piece mm -hmm. in the show. Um, because we're talking about like life, that's how the circle of life, right? Beginning, the end, and then it's just going back and revisit that whole idea. Um, life and death, kind of like that. And the tea itself is ceremony. We have the beginning and then we have the end of it. And conversation you have with your mom, there's the beginning, the end of it. And a ritual that she is so longing for that sees each other again on Sunday and that's memory just like revisit itself um, and I'm, I'm glad that somehow right, the piece was broken and I asked him hey were you gonna make another one I'm like oh, I like it like that you just leave it there <laughs> so that's how it is and one more thing that I didn't realize until I saw you performing this yesterday is he's almost um, Playing like a drag, you get like the dragon dance. Oh no, he told me he specifically was modeling his movements off the oh, dragon dance. So that's just the reason why yeah. too. Okay, so because it's yeah. almost similar um, the position that he moved his body and make it uh, in such a way. Yeah, this is magical. Yep. So. Okay. Thank you all. Okay.